Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning giving you praise. It is your name alone that is worthy of praise. Lord, you alone and by your own design and will created all that we know. The stars, the heavens, the mountains, the hills, the creatures great and small. And then you created man in your own image. And it was us. Father, we turned our back on you. We disobeyed. And for that, we deserve your wrath. But Lord, instead of pouring out your wrath, you sent your only son to die in our place. And Father, for all eternity, we will give you praise for that. And Lord, we have gathered as your children, as your people this morning to give you our praise, to give you our praise in fellowship, to give you our praise in song, to give you our praise as we listen to your word. And Father, we pray that your spirit would work in a mighty way in our hearts. Reveal our sin to us that we might repent. And Father, that we might continue to be transformed into that image of your beautiful son, the perfect sinless one who died in our place. That we would go from here and be energized by your spirit to bring your name glory, to witness to others, to let them know of the good news of Jesus Christ who died for them. And we give you all the glory, all the praise, and it's in your son's precious and sweet name we pray. Amen. Well, it's good to gather and sing, isn't it? Sing together, worship the Lord together. And I'm going to invite you this morning to Isaiah 5, because in Isaiah 5, did you know the Lord sings songs? The Lord Jesus is a songwriter. And so, God willing, this morning and next Sunday morning, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 5. Uh, the subject of the song we're going to find out is a sad subject. Actually, it's a message of doom, a message of judgment. Uh, but we're going to be thinking about this, and so I'm going to invite you to follow along in your Bibles this morning as we come to Isaiah chapter 5, right? Isaiah chapter 5, the Lord is likening his people to a vineyard, right? We know what a vineyard is. Uh, we, we know about orchards here in West Michigan. And so God says in chapter 5, verse 1, the prophet Isaiah, let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes. Now notice in this image, in this song that is presented before us, uh, the Lord went to every expense. He, he put a lot of effort into this vineyard. It talks about uh, it was a very fertile hill, so it was very fertile territory. Uh, the Lord went to much effort to digging out, clearing it of stones. There are many rocks in the Middle East, uh, planting it with the very best vines. A tower would have been built. In Bible days, they'd build towers and vineyards so the owner or whoever the steward of that property could climb up in the, the tower and keep watch for thieves who might try to come and steal the produce. And so no effort was spared to put this uh, vineyard together. And so God is looking to yield grapes, but the end of verse 2 says, but it yielded wild grapes, or literally stink fruit, right? Here, it's logical, isn't it? If you have a garden... If you, if you have a flower garden, you put all that effort in there, you're, you're looking to have beautiful flowers. If you have a vegetable garden, you're looking to have vegetables. If you have a vineyard or if you have a, an orchard, you're looking for peaches or apples or cherries, all right? I mean, that's just logical. You put all this effort and time into this, this producing this area, working in this area, and you're looking for produce. You're looking for fruit. You're looking for vegetables. God did this. But all it yielded was wild grapes, right? Often in the Bible, God reviews what he's done for his people. 
Uh, for example, Moses does this in Deuteronomy, and Joshua does this at the end of that book, and uh, Samuel does it, and Stephen does it, and, and Paul reviews in, in Romans chapter 9 how God has blessed the people, the Israeli people, the Jewish people. He says there are Israelites in Romans 9, 4. To them belong the adoption and, and the, the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Uh, the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the rescuer, the Savior from sin for Jews and Gentiles, came from the Jewish people. And so often God reviews what he's done for his people and the blessings of what he's given to them. And so having given them all these blessings, God is looking for fruit. He's looking for good harvest. But what does he find? Wild grapes. There should have been obedience God says in verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard than I have not done in it? When I look for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? He's looking at his people, Israel. He's looking at his people, Judah. There's two, the, the, the south, south was known as Judah. The north was known as Israel. Two tribes in the south, ten in the north. Yeah, two in the south, ten in the north. And God is saying, I'm looking for fruit, but all I'm seeing is wild grapes. And so verses 5 and 6 talks about God is going to bring judgment. He's going to bring judgment, and he did. For the Assyrians in the north, the Babylonians in the south. So what I'd like to do here this morning and next week, there are six, in chapter 5, there are six woes. These are messages of doom. We'll look at three this morning, God willing, three next week. Th these are six examples of the stink fruit or the wild grapes that are mentioned there in verse 2. There's six choices that the people were making that were leading them to ruin. All six of these begin, as I, begin with the word woe. Right? It is a doom song. It is a doom message. You say, well, that doesn't sound very encouraging. I, I want us to learn from history. I want us to learn from the history of Judah and Israel right? We'll, we'll, make, we'll make parallels with our day, but I want you to see that, that God blesses people, and God is looking for fruit, God expecting fruit. And what is, what is the product of our life? What, what are we giving to the Lord? And so the first one we'll look at in Isaiah chapter 5 is found in verse 8. I encourage you to read Isaiah 5 in the next week, and you can find these six woes. The first one is in verse number 8. And that verse says, Woe to those who join house to house, who add field to field, until there is no more room, and you're all made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. The first evidence of unbelief, the first stink fruit or wild grape or a pattern that the people were living that is given by the prophet Isaiah here, who, by the way, had over a half century ministry, is unrestrained greediness, unrestrained greediness. You see there in verse number six, they're, they're joining house to house, field to field, until there's no more room. They're just grabbing up land and property. They're covetous. They're desiring more and more. And we'll see here, they're oppressing people. They're, they're exploiting people. See, God was very explicit, if you go back and study the Old Testament, that he gave certain sections of land to families. Every 50 years, we come along called the year of Jubilee, and in that year of Jubilee, property was to come back to the original owner. I mean, God was very dead set against people exploiting people, right? ruling over people, oppressing other people. So God had that right in the calendar every 50 years, a year of Jubilee. You remember in 1 Kings 21, when a man by the name of Naboth had a beautiful piece of property. It had been in his family for, for, for decades and decades and a long, long time. And King Ahab looked out one day and he said, that's a beautiful piece of property. I would like to have that piece of property. 
And so he went over to Naboth. Now think about this. This is the king showing up to Naboth and saying, Naboth, I would like your property. You name the price, I want your property. Remember what Naboth said? This piece of property has been in my family for, for a long time. I can't give it to you. Even though you're the king, even though you carry a lot of clout, I can't just give this to you. The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. It's kind of like, in some way, and I think about this, in Michigan you'll see signs out in front of farms sometimes, and what will it say? A centennial farm, right? That this farm has been in this family for at least 100 years. Well, it's similar to that. Here, here is Naboth. This piece of property has been in the family a long time. He can't just up and sell it to the king, right? That's how important this was to many of the people. Micah, who lived at the same time of Isaiah, explains what is going on. I'll just reference that over here uh, in the book of Micah. He says this in Micah chapter 2, that woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. Now think about this. People are lying on their beds, and what are they plotting? When the morning dawns, they're going to get up, and covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. See that? Even though it's been in the family for a long time, might makes right. The idea is it's in the power of my hand to do this. I have the influence. I have the power. And so I'm going to use what I have to take something away from somebody else. Right? Amos says that the people oppress the poor and crush the needy, right? Ahab and Jezebel, remember, uh, going back to the Naboth incident, Ahab comes home and he has uh, the old Pass the Pirate song, he has poochy lip disease. He's laying on his bed and he's pouting. He's acting like a little three-year-old. And Jezebel comes in and says, what's the matter? And he says, well, that fellow Naboth, I wanted to buy the property and he won't sell it to me. You remember what Jezebel does? She said, well, you're the king. You can have what you want. Just we'll work this out. And so she concocts this plan. She calls this big banquet. She invites these false test people to come in to give false testimonies. They lie against Naboth. They take him out and kill him. There, Jezebel says, the property is yours. Go take it, Ahab. By the way, that's when God sent uh, Elijah to say, what you've done is wrong and you will die, king, all right? But, but this is the attitude. I'm bigger, I'm more powerful, I'm stronger, I have more leverage, and so what is yours will become mine. In Nehemiah 5, we read about other men have our fields and our vineyards. There was a problem in Nehemiah's day. Remember in Luke chapter 12, the Bible tells, uh, the, the, Jesus told a parable about a man God had given to him a, a very fertile farm. God had given seed and sunshine and rain. And this man had had a bountiful harvest, fabulous harvest. And so he looks out upon the harvest. Is his first thought, God has so blessed me. God has given me so much. God has given me this wonderful harvest. I'm going to turn around and assist that family down the road whose husband was injured in combat. He cannot help care for his family very well. He's been injured very severely. Family is a very difficult situation. So I'm going to assist them with the produce that God has given to me. Is that his first thought? Is his first thought, there's a widow lady down the road whose husband was crushed by the wagon when it rolled over while I was working on the farm. She has five children. She's having difficulty making ends meet. I'm going to assist her with the bounty God's given to me. Is his thought that there's another widow a little further down the road. She's getting up in years now. She has difficulty getting around. She's having a hard time getting enough to eat. I can assist her with what God has given to me. Was that what his first thought? Do you remember Luke chapter 12? The man's first response was this, quote, I will tear down my barns and what? Build bigger barns. That's his first response. I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, you can just see him talking to himself. Soul, 
You have ample goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. Remember that? God had other plans, didn't it? God said, you fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. You see, the issue was not the bountiful harvest. The issue was not being a prosperous farmer. The issue was his greed. The issue was his thinking only of himself. He didn't think of anyone else at all. Unbridled greed. In Luke chapter 19, we read about a man by the name of Zacchaeus who was a tax collector and he was rich. Do you know how he became wealthy? He became wealthy by exploiting people. See, he worked for the Roman government. And let's suppose you owe the Roman government $100. And so Zacchaeus would come on the scene and say, you owe the Roman government $100. Oh, by the way, to make things go smooth, give me $115 and we'll take care of the situation. See, he was making money on his position. He was using his authority to exploit other people. Exodus chapter 20, the Lord says in one of the Ten Commandments, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, wife, male servant, female servant, ox, donkey, Chevrolet, Ford, Cadillac. No, it doesn't say that, but we could, couldn't it? Anything that's your neighbor's. You're not to covet it. By the way, just as a parenthesis a little bit here, you, you, you remember the Bible teaches private ownership, the blessing of private ownership. You should not cover your neighbor's house, anything that belongs to your neighbor. The Bible preach, uh, teaches private property is a, is a gift from God. Now, the problem is, as we become covetous, the problem is, as in Isaiah's day, we're joining house to house and field to field and oppressing people. That's the danger. But God gives to us in the Scripture, very clear in Scripture, the blessing of private ownership, all right? Private ownership. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 4, you have the account there. And in the fourth chapter, you can just take note of this that when there was a need in the church, it says the owners of the lands or houses sold them. They weren't pressured to do that, but somebody owned property, somebody owned houses. They sold them and then brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid at the apostles' feet so that needs of people were, uh, were met. Ananias and Sapphira were there in Acts chapter 5. The issue with Ananias and Sapphira was not that they had private property. The issue is they lied about the price. Very clear. Peter says there, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? It was yours. And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? You could buy or sell what you wish. What is it that you have contrived in your heart, this deed? You've not lied to man, but to God. See, the issue there was not private ownership. The issue was lying, deception. And Ananias and Sapphira, you remember, were killed there. Uh, one just a few hours after the other. So the Bible teaches private ownership, but the Bible is very clear about the danger that can arise in our hearts of covetousness, of wanting more and more. Someone said, how much to be happy? Answer, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more, right? 1 Corinthians 5 warns, don't associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother. Okay, so we're in the local church, associating with, fellowshipping with, sweet fellowshipping with, somebody who names the name of Christ. And one of the things that are mentioned there is if he's guilty of greed. So it becomes evident in, 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 among God's people that here's a person who's pursuing greed. They're pursuing things, pursuing stuff. The church is responsible to go to that brother, knowing the situation, seeing what's taking place, to seek to rescue that person, pull them back. See, greed will destroy an individual. Colossians 3, 5 warns, put to death covetousness, which is idolatry. You say, well, we don't have idols today like in the Old Testament. We don't, we don't build golden calves. Uh, we have idolatry today also covetousness. 
when we covet something, when we use our authority, our power to exploit somebody else, to, to, we have the inside track, inside knowledge to get an advantage of somebody else so we can get something, say. We need to be careful. We need to be repenting continually of covetousness. See, God is never against wealth in the Bible. But he is against when we use our position, we use our wealth to, to degrade somebody else, to bring somebody else down, to take advantage of somebody else. In James chapter 2, we read, But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Again, the attitude here among some was might makes right. If I can do it and get away with it, I will do it because my life consists of more stuff, more and more things. 1 Timothy chapter 6 gives excellent, excellent counsel. God breathed counsel as to what we're to do with material things. You see, the Bible, again, it's not an issue of having things. It's when things have us. That's the issue. 1 Timothy chapter 6, listen to verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, and by the way, you know, every one of us here in this room are wealthy by the, by the situation of most of the people in the world today. You go to other places in the world. I've been in Romania. I've been in Brazil. We've been in Dominican Republic, right? We've seen poverty, all right? We have food to eat today. We have shelter over our heads. So we will be considered as rich, some more than others. But here's the thing. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. That's the danger, isn't it? Kind of like, look what I've done. I did this. I pulled myself up by all my own bootstraps. Not to be haughty. Number two, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. The Bible talks about in Proverbs that the, the wealthy man who sets his hope on riches is imagining things. He thinks it's like a high wall that's going to protect him. That can go down just like that. How many remember 2008 and 2009? That wasn't very long ago. The uncertainty of riches. Set your hope not on those but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They're to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share there. That's what that farmer should have done in Luke 12 when he had that bountiful harvest, to think of others he could help. Oh, yes, it was fine to, to thank God and, to, and to, to have things, but to use things, not to oppress other people, but to use things and resources to bless and love and help other people. See? So those who kept grabbing land, going back to our text in Isaiah chapter 5, God said, everything that you have will be desolate. Isaiah 5, 9, and 10. It's all going to be gone. The houses will be desolate. The large and beautiful houses will, will have no one living in them. Ten acres of the vineyard shall yield but one bath. A homer of seed shall yield but an epith. It, it, will, be, it will be just scarce fruit being born in the time. Well, we thank the Lord that God can change greedy hearts. It can change our hearts. We can be repenting of that. And God can be changing our hearts of coveting because we uh, consider again Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19 there. And the Lord came along, remember, and he said, Zacchaeus, I see you up in the tree. Come down right now. I'm going to your house. And Jesus came into the house. And Zacchaeus evidences salvation by the fact if I've stolen from anyone, I will restore. You read that passage in Luke chapter 19. It's evidence. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. Zacchaeus showed that he had truly come to the Lord by the fact that now it's not a heart of covetousness that is grabbing him. Now it's a recognition he's, he's, he's sinned against God. He's sinned against other people. And his heart desires to make things right. He's no longer going to use that authority as a, as a tax collector to abuse that position. He's going to make things right with people. So that's the first well. Notice the second one. It's found in verse 11. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may run after strong drink, who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them. 
They have lyre and harp. These are musical instruments. Tambourine and flute and wine at their feasts. But they do not regard the deeds of the Lord or see the work of his hands. They're more concerned. Here's the second one is chasing after strong drink and wine. They're more concerned with temporary than they are with eternal. They're not regarding the deeds of the Lord. They don't see the work of his hands. They're not listening to the voice of God. They're caught up with what they want to do at the present moment. Isaiah chapter 28 elaborates on this. When the text says in Isaiah 28, talks about the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim. And down verse 3, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim will be trodden underfoot. And then later, they, these reel with wine. They're reeling with wine. That's, a, that's from a vine. And stagger with strong drink. That's from grain. The priests and the prophet reel with strong drink. They're swallowed by wine. They stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. All tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. Now, if you've ever been around people who have drank too much, you know that this picture is very accurate. Amos talks about people drinking wine in bowls. Drinking wine in bowls. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, reminds us that wine, that's the beverage from the vine, is a mocker. Wine mocks people. It ridicules people, makes fun of people. Verse goes on, it says, strong drink, that's the beverage from grain, is a brawler. A brawler. I, I thought about here, if we could just... Where we are this morning, go one mile in a circle from where we are right now. One mile in a circle for just the last 24 hours. And think about one mile out in every direction from Stando Baptist Church from the last 24 hours, the fighting, the quarreling, the, 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 the arrests, the auto wrecks possibly, perhaps even fatalities in automobiles that have taken place because of alcohol, because of the consumption of alcohol. Strong drink is a brawler, and the whosoever is led astray by it is not wise. A people pursuing that which mocks them brought great trouble and took them down the road of folly. That's Proverbs 20, verse 1. Someone says, well, didn't Jesus turn the water into wine? The Greek word oinos can mean fresh grape juice. Someone says, didn't Paul say, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake to Timothy? Well, that verse goes on and talks about and for your frequent infirmities or frequent ailments. See, Timothy had a stomach problem, and so this was for medicine, a highly diluted with water. Timothy has some health issues, so Paul's saying, Timothy, make sure you take this for medicine purposes, for your health. Solomon's mother in Proverbs 31 gave him counsel. Later in life, he's addressed there as King Lemuel, but in Proverbs 31 there, his mother warns him about this. Listen in Proverbs chapter 31. The, king's, the words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. Verse 2, what are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my womb? What are you doing, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy kings. So don't chase after women, king. It's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine. There's a word, or rulers to drink strong drink, the same as over in Isaiah. Lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. So, so what, do you, what do you use this for? We'll give strong drink, verse 6, to the one who is perishing. Someone who's dying, whose body is racked with pain. It'd be like a medicine. We, we use that today in hospice. Someone is dying and they have medicine to deal with the pain. And wine, verse 6, to those in bitter distress. Some catastrophic matter in life. This isn't something that's just people take just to sit down socially. See, let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. It's catastrophic things 
right? The mother of Lemuel warns her son about this. Paul said in 1 Timothy 3, concerning elders or pastors, they're, they're not to be a drunkard. Literally, they don't tarry alongside the wine. The deacons, they're not addicted to much wine. They don't come alongside of that. Ephesians says, do not drunk, be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. The, the idea is it leads to reckless action. Just like I talked about, just take one mile out in the last 24 hours. Recklessness, debauchery. 1 Corinthians 11, we read that some were assembling at the Lord's Supper like we had last week. They were coming to God's house under the influence of alcohol. I tell you, years of pastoral ministry, years of working with families, working in the Berry County Jail, I want to tell you, I've never come to see anything of benefit from alcohol. Never, in almost 40 years. I talked with a friend last week. He goes into the prisons in the UP up in Newberry. He said, alcohol always brought trouble to those men he's worked with, and he's worked with many, many, many of them. It's always trouble. It's a mocker. It ridicules. It, it laughs at us. It brings trouble and brawling and hardship and, and, and grief and rips families apart and marriages apart. Coming back to Isaiah, again, chapter 5, God says they love wine and strong drink, but it's not going to satisfy. Verse 13 they're going to go hungry, and they're going to be parched with thirst. Okay, it's never going to satisfy. The question I like to ask is, what are you looking for at the bottom of that can or the bottom of that bottle? What are you looking for? You're never going to find it. Here's the third one. First one is there in verse 8. It's just ongoing greed. The second is the pursuit of, of wine and, and even today, alcohol. We just I walked into our local gas station yesterday. Right there, right you walk in. We're not just talking about beer. We're talking about much stronger than beer, right? Local paper, one page, the, the brew fest that's coming to Middleville, Michigan, which isn't far from us, and on the other page, it seemed like about every third or fourth billboard up and down 131 and across I-94 now is for not just talking about medical marijuana. We're talking about recreational marijuana here in the state of Michigan. We're, we're more and more giving ourselves over to that which can alter the mind, which does a work in us, Amos 6, where we're not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. We're just interested in that which will deaden our conscience and will give us just a temporary lift or a temporary freedom from problems of life. You'll never find it. Never find it. Now, praise God. God can rescue from addiction to drugs and alcohol. Praise God for that. The Lord can rescue. The Lord is able to rescue. And so we have great hope that God is able to work. We're thankful for that. Now, there's a third one here. We come to verse 18. The third woe that's in Isaiah 5. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood, who draws sin as with cart ropes. Now, we'll start there for a minute. I want to put a picture in your mind, all right? Imagine this in your mind. There is a cart or a wagon that's typically pulled by, harnessed to animals, oxen or, 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 or horses. But this cart or this wagon is not harnessed to oxen or, or horses. It's harnessed to people. So you see that in your mind? A wagon harnessed to people, right? One commentator said this, people are so intent on sinning, they're like beasts harnessed to a heavy cart, which they must drag about with them. So the, the woe of verse 18, the message of doom is this, a persistence in unbelief, as you'll see in the latter part of this verse, defiance of God. So you go back to that picture of uh, that cart with people attached to it with ropes. They think they're free, but they're attached to it. And, and the picture goes on. You've had this situation probably. Think back in your childhood to maybe skating or a skateboard or, or even in your vehicle. And you start on in a fairly level grade. Surface, but the grade 
starts to get more and more steep. I remember being in California years ago and a long grade at the top, it didn't look like much, but pretty soon I was doing like 85 miles an hour. I wouldn't even try and I, I got to stop down here at the bottom or slow down, right? This is a long, long grade. You've been in a situation like that and the farther you go, the faster you go, right? Our daughter once got on a skateboard. She didn't realize, I can remember this day, there was a 90 degree turn at the bottom. It was getting steeper. She's going to have to either jump off, maybe get hurt, or it's going to be big hurt at the bottom. She can't make that 90 going that fast. That's the picture here. People are going faster and faster. Barnes says this, begin to sin little by little. And the sins grow and increase until they're strong and are like a rope about them. See? Evil is at first like a fine string, but the finishing is like a heavy cart rope, plunging deeper and deeper into sin, adding one sin to another. This is an unquenchable thirst for iniquity, a constant hunger. You just can't get enough. A person will go out and they'll be, someone will dare them to steal something, and so there will be a rush. Stole it. Wow. But you know what? Next time you go out, I dare you to do this. That doesn't give much of a rush anymore. You got to be more bold. You got to be more strong. You got to do something in broad daylight. You got to up the ante, see, because you don't get the rush from just stealing something small. That's the picture here. They're going faster and faster down the hill, bound not just by this thin string, a fine string, but a heavy rope. Thinking they're free, but they're bound. Proverbs reminds us, his own iniquity shall take the wicked and he'll be held with the cords of his sin. How often we think that, the foolishness of us to think, someone out here thinking, someone watching, thinking that somehow I'm free. I can do what I wish. I don't have to listen to mom and dad. I don't have to listen to the church. I don't have to listen to the principal at school. I don't have to listen to the police officers. I can do what I want, thinking they're free. But in reality, they're bound with, with, with heavier and heavier ropes and they're, they're tied to that cart, to that wagon, and they're going faster and faster and faster down the ever-increasing grade of the hill. And I tell you what, again, as, as a pastor, it's grieved me over the years to see people, you know what's going to happen. You know they're going this direction. You know they're, they're hanging out with this, these people. They're not there to be a witness. They're not there to be a testimony. They're there just because they're kind of becoming more interested in that lifestyle. And, 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 and people will warn them. People will call them. People will go by and see them. But no, they, they know best. They, they know what they're doing. It's amazing how intelligent we think we can be and how smart we can think when we're by ourselves when six or eight other people are, are warning, warning us, warning us who love us. Tragedy, disaster, there's always the bottom of the hill. There's always the bottom of the hill. So not only is there this faster and faster getting into sin, but notice the latter part of the verse Verse 19, rather, says, who say, let him be quick. Let him speed his work, that we may see it, that the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and let it come that we may know it. They're taunting God. That's what's here. They're defying God. They're, 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 they're saying to God, I dare you, move quickly. They're speaking to God here, to, to, to the prophet Isaiah. I dare you, come over here. Let's see what God will do. And let me just say, as you read the Bible and you look at life, it is the way of foolishness to taunt God. It is the way of foolishness to somehow think that, that you or I can do this and this and this, and God is somehow not around or not aware of what's going on. The Bible says there's no fear of God in their eyes. It is the way of folly to think that somehow we can keep getting away with things and God doesn't see and God doesn't know. God is not aware. And, and what we sow, we will reap. This is the whole attitude. Sennacherib had this attitude. Second Chronicles 32 
Here's what he said. Who among all the gods of those nations was able to deliver this people from my hand? How much less will your God deliver you out of my hand? Sennacherib, who was a mighty general, said, or king, said, I've defeated everyone. No one can defeat me. Your God is no match for me. Pharaoh had that attitude. Remember in the book of Exodus? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? He found out, didn't he? That, that those, uh, the, 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 these weren't children. I think the old King James says children. Remember the, the, the Elisha incident? Go up, bald head. Go up, bald head. That, that, was a, that was a gang of young men who knew exactly what they were doing. They were taunting Elijah. They were mocking the God of Elijah. And they were saying to Elijah, Elijah got out of here. He went up in the whirlwind. You get out of here, Elijah. We don't want you here. They were taunting the God of Elisha and Elijah. Goliath was taunting God. Remember what happened to him. He was defying the armies of the living God, David said. He cursed David by his gods. I am the champion. Come out here. You're but a boy. I'll make quick work of you. Proverbs 30. The adulterous woman says this. It says she eats, wipes her mouth, and says, I have done nothing wrong. Taunting God. Jeremiah talks about the brazen look of a prostitute who refuses to be ashamed. I want you to take your Bibles, go to Daniel chapter 5 as we close, and I want to look at another example of the folly of taunting God, of mocking God. Daniel, the fifth chapter. We come to this account of a king by the name of Belshazzar. And in Daniel chapter 5, we read that he made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Now imagine that. Imagine a, a big conference hall downtown Grand Rapids and a thousand people are gathered and the king is present and they're drinking there. Verse 2 says, Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had overrun Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been sacked and the temple destroyed and all these artifacts from the temple had been taken by, the, by uh, Nebuchadnezzar back. And so that's what they pull out. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of silver, pardon me, gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. You see, what they're saying is, these gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which we know are no gods, but our gods have defeated Israel's God, and so they're taunting the true and the living God. Now, let me say this. Sometimes God acts immediately, as we're going to say. Sometimes God delays because he is so very gracious. He is so very kind. He is very long-suffering, the second Peter says. He waits. But I'm just saying, you do not taunt God. You do not mock God. You, you don't shake your fa fist in God's face and say, I dare you. I heard somebody, uh, a dear pastor of mine said the other day, someone was defying God, and uh, shortly thereafter, all right, God sent a lightning bolt, and they were in a sleeping bag, and it melted the zipper in the sleeping bag. Now, do you think they got their attention, God got their attention, in a sleeping bag, and a lightning bolt comes through? I'm just saying, you don't taunt God. Sooner or later. But here's what happened right away. Immediately, verse 5, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall, the king's palace, opposite the lampstand. Now flip your page over. If you, right, we won't read the whole passage. I wish we had time to. But here's what it said. Come clear over to 25. This is the writing. Verse 26, this is interpretation. God has numbered the days of your kingdom. 
King, you think you're pretty high and mighty. King, you're drinking wine and giving credit to these gods of gold and silver and wood. You think you have beaten, you've defied the true and the living God? Your days have numbered and been brought to an end. Verse 27, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. God has a set of scales. In verse 28, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And then drop down to verse 30. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, right? God immediately, verse 5, acted in the defiance and the attitude of this king who dared rise up and say, we defeated the king of Judah. We defeated the God of Judah. We are more powerful. Our gods are more awesome than this God. And God said, I'm going to show you something, and I'm going to do it right now, see. So coming back to our text again as we close in Isaiah chapter 5, the first woe was just land grabbing, uncontrolled covetousness. The second in verse 11 was pursuing, running after alcohol and strong drink and that which alters the mind. The third woe was there in verse uh, number 18, was just unbelief and persistent defiance of the true and the living God. Alex Maltier said this, two questions by which human character can be traced. Number one, is sin hated or relished? That'd be verse 18. Is it hated or relish. And by the way, not just out there sin, but first of all, right here. We can get really good at out there sin. What about sin right here we allow, we cherish? Are we hating that sin or are we permitting it? Second question Motyer said was this, is God reverenced or flouted? Verse 19. Is God reverenced or he is flouted? Now the name Isaiah the prophet Isaiah, probably the greatest prophet of Israel, ministered for over 50 years. His name means the Lord saves. Every time somebody heard his name, there was a reminder that only the Lord can rescue. So the good news this morning is this. The fabulous news this morning is for all of us that the Lord can rescue us from these woes. If we'll humble ourselves and repent, the Lord can and will rescue us. He delights in rescuing us. He delights in a humble heart. He delights in rescuing us from our greediness, from drugs, from alcohol, from unbelief and defiance. He delights in doing that. So run to the only one who can rescue. We can't pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. The Lord can rescue us. We'd be happy, I would be happy to talk with you, to point you to the Lord Jesus Christ, the giver of life, the light of the world, others here as well. Don't turn a deaf ear to the God who's calling this morning. Let's pray. Our Lord, today we are a foolish people. If we think that we can find something apart from you, that will satisfy not only in this life, but also for eternity. Lord, often we're a greedy people. You can rescue us from that. Often we're a people who think that we can find our, our joy, our delight in something that can alter our minds, be it alcohol, be it drugs, be it something that causes us in any way to be less alert to the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Oh, Lord, I thank you that you can rescue us from unbelief. You can rescue us from the folly of taunting God. Your prophet's name was Isaiah. The Lord rescues. And, Lord, we take great delight in that. And I pray for any that are here this morning, present or watching online or who will later, they would humble themselves and run to the only one who can rescue the Lord Jesus Christ, who hung on the cross of Calvary, who bore our sin, who rose again the third day to give us eternal life. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.